I would like to thank uh, our guest of honor, uh, our panelists, and you, our audience, for joining us. Uh, before I move on to more formal introductions, uh, let's take care of some business. <laughs> uh, we at the Northwest University Press want to thank the event's co-sponsors, Last Hours Puerto Rican section, the MLA Global Hispanophone Forum, uh, the MLA Latino Latina Literature and Culture Forum, uh, because they helped us disseminate the event and, and get you wonderful people in our audience. Uh, a bit of a warning, this event will be recorded for posterity's sake and posted uh, or streamed on the press's Facebook. Um, okay. During the panelist conversation, make sure to send in your questions for them using the Q&A function found in the bottom of your screen somewhere around here. <laughs> the chat function has been disabled uh, for this meeting. We'll reserve some time at the end after our panelists uh, participate uh, to share your questions with them and they will answer and we'll get a nice discussion going. Uh, I believe that is all of the business. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> Finally, Decolonizing Diasporas is available for purchase at NU Press's website uh, with a 25% discount. Uh, the promo code is NUP2020. Make sure to put that in around checkouts. Again, NUP2020. Uh, I will put this now on your chat. Okay. So let me introduce our author and panelists uh, so we can get this going. Uh, Joe Maira Figueroa Vasquez is our guest of honor, and she is an associate professor of global diaspora studies in the Department of English at Michigan University. Nelson Maldonado Torres is a professor at the Department of Latino and Caribbean Studies and the Comparative Literature Program at Rutgers University. He is the author of Against War, Views from the Under Underside of Modernity, and a member of the Executive Board of the Franz Fanon Foundation. And finally, Benita San Pedro Vizcaya is a professor of Spanish Colonial Studies at Hofstra University and was the founding Associate Director of Hofstra's Center for Race, Culture, and Social Justice. She's a leading expert on Spanish colonialism in both Africa and Latin America, and her work revisits colonial links within and beyond the frame of different imperial Atlantic networks. So I'm gonna pass the baton over to our guest of honor and mute myself. And after all our panelists, panelists participate, I will come back for the Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and I want to, to thank Anne um, for organizing um, this event. Um, for everyone for uh, registering and participating, um, and also to the pan panelists for agreeing um, to read my book beforehand and to show up at 7.30 p.m. in the middle of the week um, to come and talk about it. Um, you know, one of the things that you'll notice is that uh, Dr. Lorja Garcia Peña is not here today. Um, she's given me permission to see, talk a little bit, and I want to kind of center this at the forefront of this event um, for the reason that she's not here today. Yesterday, she faced um, a very violent uh, Zoom bombing um, at an event that she did um, at Georgia State University, um, and it has uh, deeply affected her. Um, it was uh, pretty terrible. It was aimed at her and at uh, some of the organizers of the event. Um, and one of the things that I want um, us to consider as we're thinking through this work, but also thinking through the work um, that is being produced by Black women and Afro-Latina women um, and, and scholars who are um, attempting to combat the um, the you know white supremacy and cis heteropatriarchy um, that is consuming us at every moment um, is is trying to figure out how we can both amplify the work but also protect um, and support um, the folks who are being attacked in these ways. Um, and so my heart goes out to Lorja today. I'm sure she will be able to see this recording. Um, and uh, you know if you are on you know Twitter or on you know social media in some way and can send her some words of support, that would be really great. Um, you know, she really needs it and so do so many of these other organizers and activists um, and scholars and thinkers who are putting themselves out there and facing this kind of dehumanizing backlash. Um, so once again, I wanted to thank you all for being here. I'm gonna talk just for a few minutes about the book. I was told to just frame the book a little bit um, and then I'll hand um, the, this off to Nelson and Benita. 
um, to talk and then we we'll, can engage in a conversation and also uh, also be taking questions via the Q&A function. Um, so I'm just gonna, I don't have anything prepared, I'll just talk off the cuff about the book. Um, the Colonists and Diaspora's Radical Mappings of Afro-Atlantic Literature is my first monograph. Um, it was just published by Northwestern University Press. Thank you, Northwestern, for organizing this event. Um, the book um, puts together in relation, in conversation, the literature and culture productions emerging from the Latinx Caribbean, specifically Afro-Latinx work coming from Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic, produced in the diaspora in relationship to to the work from Equatorial Guinea, um, which is the only Spanish-speaking nation state in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and the work that is produced in, in exile, in diaspora, um, in Spain. And so in this way, it is um, a project that puts, um, or that, that frames this kind of South-to-South -South dialogue in the global north um, and really trying to expand what we can know um, and, and what these works can tell us about the Afro-Atlantic. Um, the book itself takes up uh, five themes and the themes build on one another. Um, I begin the book um, with uh, thinking through relations through the frame of decolonial thought, of women of color feminisms, of ethnic studies, thinking through archipelago studies um, and really understanding or, or trying to kind of think about the ways that um, Theorists, philosophers, and writers of color, decolonial thinkers, offer us ways to read and reread projects that are not necessarily only in the kind of vein of traditional literary theory or cultural studies. Um, this is not a kind of new project in that way. I've had a lot of um, projects that have, um, you know, offered themselves as a framework for me um, to think about the importance of um, looking at these works through the lens of a decolonial women of color feminist thinkers. Um, and so I, I open the book with relations. I end the book with the sea. Um, the image on the cover of the book is um, shown at the very final chapter. And then the middle chapters um, build from thinking through intimacy um, of dictatorship and occupation, um, beginning by looking at three texts um, and kind of trying to figure out, you know, what is happening within this, these literary um, uh, texts, what is happening in this literary corpora, um, and uh, sh trying to think through the ways that um, erotic freedom and corporal consciousness and what Jessica Marie Johnson calls Black femme freedom emerge um, through and against, um, and even sometimes within um, these kind of power structures um, that attempt to kind of cur curtail um, our, ex our, you know, bodily expressions, our expressions of the human, um, but also attempt to, uh, to curtail our own notions of ourselves um, um, and even what we can eat, sustenance, um, what we can wear, right? Um, and looking at the ways that uh, women in, in particular um, are able to face um, these power structures that are both really broad, but also really intimate um, and are able to face them and, and traverse them. Um, I asked that question in order to kind of set up for the rest of the book, you know, if all of these things are going on in these three very different texts, um, within uh, these uh, literary groups, um, what are they asking us to see, right? Like, are we reading them in a way that would, uh, as the average reader, are we kind of thinking about them as texts that can show us more um, about what liberation could look like? Um, and so I go there to think about like, well, if we're looking at these texts, are we witnessing them? And what does faithful witnessing look like? And so building on the work of the late decolonial feminist philosopher Maria Lugones, the next chapter takes up the concept of faithful witnessing um, and expands it to think about what it means to witness faithfully in relationship to other oppressed people, um, thinking through some of the kind of philosophical questions around recognition and witnessing, um, looking at the kind of feminist um, and decolonial feminist positions on what witnessing looks like um, within the context of, um, of consistent ongoing uh, colonialism and oppression, and looking at the ways that the texts themselves engage in forms of witnessing um, that go beyond colonial understandings of witnessing, um, where characters and, and folks are working together with one another against power groups and put themselves in danger, right? Um, in an effort uh, to bear witness to one another's humanity and to one another's struggles as well as triumphs. Um, I end that chapter by thinking about like, well, if witnessing is this kind of important part um, of a decolonial praxis, what are the first things that we should be witnesses to? 
in the next chapter, I argue that one of the first things that we should bear witness to is this concept of this theater, which again comes from within the work itself. Um, and it is my way to kind of think through and meditate on the realities of uh, diaspora and exile within decolonial context, thinking about this theater, the being torn away forcefully from one's land, from one's languages and practices as a precondition to colonial modernity, um, as something that we must bear witness to. But um, to do so, right, um, is not only trying to understand our own histories of dispossession and displacement um, in diaspora, um, but also to be able to bear witness to someone else's, right? Um, and I speak from the position of like a Black Puerto Rican colonial subject living in the settler colonial nation of the United States um, and thinking about those um, difficulties, right? How do we, how can we see each other across these oftentimes untenable, um, irreconcilable differences? Um, and I argue that the, these texts offer us some ways to imagine um, how this theater is not just um, the, the struggle against dispossession or not just dispossession, but also the struggle and resistance to this form of dispossession through different practices. Um, I then ask the question about reparations, right? So if dispossession, the theater is this, you know, constitutive part of colonial modernity in the modern world system, um, what does reparations look like? Um, not as opposed to money. <laughs> um, I think that's where some people get caught up. It's like, okay, well, we need, we need the funds. And, and so one of the things that I'm thinking about is if we were to imagine that, yes, reparations are necessary, um, uh, but what about what does reparations look like beyond this kind of positivist models um, that would uh, try to um, create a, a dollar amount for the kinds of intergenerational pain and suffering um, and oppression faced um, by, by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, and instead, I tried to uh, think about what these uh, sets of texts offer us um, in terms of understanding what I call a reparation of the imagination, a radical remapping of our relationships with one another as we think through what a decolonial reparation could look like. Um, and again, in that chapter, I bring up the kind of tensions um, that, uh, that are created when different uh, groups of people who have been dispossessed colonized and oppressed are brought together in a particular space, making claims for liberation that oftentimes speak against each other or over one another. Um, and so um, I argue in that chapter for a reparation of the imagination um, and looking at the ways that these texts are, you know, just it, it have these incredible visions of what reparations could look like um, uh, rather than just money, right? Like in addition to um, the material reparations that are actually desperately needed and in addition to the kind of rematriation of land for indigenous people. Um, and in the final chapter uh, of the kind of middle arc of the book, um, I talk about futurities in a chapter called Apocalypso, where I look at the ways that a reparation of the imagination is engaged um, through the kind of future work, um, through the imaginings um, of futurities and worlds otherwise um, of these Afro-Atlantic subjects. So in this way, I am linking the kinds of preoccupations that emerge from within um, these kind of archipelagic um, nations, these diasporic um, displaced uh, folks, um, and having a conversation between Afro-Atlantic subjects um, as a way um, to bring um, to the fore um, a what Silvia Torres and Ramona Hernandez often talk about as like these peripheralized populations when they talk about, you know, if uh, Latinx folks are marginal, then um, in their book, The Dominican Americans, they argue that Dominicans are peripheral to that margin. And so I extend that to think about the Afro-Latinx, you know, Caribbean diaspora work, and then also Equatorial Guinea, um, a really rich, um, you know, a, a, a nation and a people who have a very rich literary history um, and who have this kind of insurgent worldview um, and who are often left out of so many discourses. Um, but what would happen if we put those in conversation with one another? How can they illuminate for one another similar experiences? Um, how do we hold space for the differences? But also what can they illuminate um, for the kind of broader liberation struggle, struggles, larger decolonial um, and decolonizing struggles? Um, and also thinking through what, what can they offer um, to a series of different fields, including literary studies, but also ethnic studies, um, Hispanic studies, Latinx studies, Caribbean studies, et cetera. Um, and so in this way, the book is a small contribution um, that pays attention to these like little places, right? Um, and, and sees how from these particular perspectives, um, they put their visions up upon the world. So thank you. I don't know if Nelson, you wanna go? 
Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Yomaira. And I have, I'm going to read uh, um, something uh, to save time. Um, and it's so sorry to hear that uh, Loria cannot be uh, with us today, but of course our thoughts are also with, with her while we are here. I would like to start by thanking Professor Figueroa for inviting me to speak about her truly fantastic and groundbreaking book, Decolonizing Diasporas, uh, in this space. I feel delighted and honored and I have had the privilege to work with Professor Figueroa in multiple settings, and I have so many fond memories of our path together. Suffice it to say that for the moment, uh, uh, for the moment that I cannot be more proud of her as a former teacher, mentor, and thankfully for me, continued interlocutor. I still remember when I read her application to graduate school, as well as the day when she stormed into my office to introduce herself and establish conversation and also when she started to very seriously engage African philosophy and literature, including stories about her encounter, I think encounter with Ngugi Wationgo at Berkeley and so much more. I remember her and her loving husband Takuma coming to a graduate seminar together and me realizing that they were well together. Uh, these memories are as fond to me as the memories of close family and I indeed consider them family. The reason why I am mentioning these encounters and relationships that exceed the orbit of the purely intellectual, professional, and academic is that this text, Decolonizing Diasporas, starts and concludes with an account of relations. I mean this literally. Relations is the title of the first chapter, and the coda uh, concludes with a short section entitled Relations Again. Relations are not memories or actions to hide, but to witness, uh, to, to practice, and to celebrate. This entire book is a celebration and a robust affirmation of relations. Without relations, there is no intimacy or witnessing or reparations, all of which are fundamental components in the spiral trajectory of the mapping of Afro-Atlantic and diasporic relations that this book offers. Suffice it to say also that when I left Puerto Rico, I did not have an idea of a place called Hoboken in New Jersey. And today I consider a Puerto Rican from Hoboken, a sister, a comrade, and a friend. But the fact that many Puerto Ricans do not know of Hoboken also creates concern and it speaks to the continued acts of mapping and remapping that we have to continue doing. Africa and Hoboken are in relation to Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico is in relation to Hoboken and Africa in an impressive amount of ways and that's only a little part of the picture. Reading this book was such a gratifying experience for so many reasons, one of which is that it is unapologetically a product of a solid and rigorous ethnic studies education. If you still wonder what is to be gained by having an undergrad or graduate degree in ethnic studies, look no more. Decolonizing diasporas explodes the confines of disciplines such as Spanish, English, as well as comparative literature and area studies. I mean explodes as in showing their limitation and making them appear obsolete. That is, when thinking about the accomplishments of this book and its radical mappings of Afro-Atlantic literature, we should not forget that Professor Figueroa's entire education, college education has taken place in ethnic studies spaces. Don't be deceived by her uh, departmental uh, uh, location necessarily, or at least some of them. Uh, she, uh, her bachelor degree was completed in Puerto Rican and Hispanic Caribbean studies at Rutgers. And her PhD is from the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. These are two massive projects of ethnic studies in the East Coast and the West Coast of this uh, country. Also extremely significant is that both departments emerged out of a student mobilization. I mean, I mean the Caribbean, Puerto Rican and Hispanic Caribbean studies at Rutgers and ethnic studies at Berkeley. They both emerge out of student mobilization in spite of the established standards 
and skewed criteria of excellence that are dominant in universities. As I mentioned, Professor Figueroa is an Afro-Puerto Rican woman from Hoboken, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico, who found a place in institutional spaces that were created by Puerto Rican, Black, Indigenous, Asian, Chicanx, and Latinx youth, Latinx youth of color. Equal important decolonizing diasporas is more than just another book or contribution to scholarship. In a typical call and response fashion, it is a document that responds to the call that one finds in ethnic studies fields, which is a call for an undisciplined as well as ethically and politically engaged scholarship that is relevant to black, indigenous, and communities of color. Professor Figueroa doesn't shy away from this. In fact, she insists in recognizing the value of this genealogy and sets of relations. This is clear from the outset. Consider the epigraph to the entire book taken from the Afro-Caribbean theorist and novelist Sylvia Winter. The epigraph taken from Winter's groundbreaking long article, The Ceremony Must Be Found After Humanism, is a grand celebration of the quote, liminal perspective of new studies, unquote, by which Winter means black studies and related intellectual projects that emerged in the late 1960s, including feminism, but not so much white feminism, of course. Winter conceives these new studies as heretical perspectives with an extraordinary potential similar to the quote unquote original heresy of the forms of study that gave birth to the humanities in Europe. A funny story here is that I think that Professor Figueroa actually became mad at me one time when in a discussion about ethnic studies as part of a series at UC Berkeley that featured Professor Michael Omi and myself, I offered a picture of ethnic studies as heresy, that is as a heretic field and a heretic praxis, very much in conversation with Winter. Uh, I believe she, uh, she could not believe I was referring to our beloved intellectual space as heretic, but more than 10 years later, it makes me so very happy and thrilled to say that Decolonizing Diasporas is a heretic book and Professor Figueroa a mad heretic thinker. But I digress. I, I do have uh, a serious question for our heretic professor and our heretic visionary Sylvia Winter. If the ceremony must be found, quote, after humanism, close quote, does this mean that it must also be found after the humanities too? That is, if a Spanish, English, comparative literature and area studies appear obsolete in the face of heretical work such as decolonizing diasporas, that's my interpretation. Doesn't this mean that the humanities as a project are also obsolete? Is in the remapping offer in decolonizing diasporas not offering us, uh, not giving us new charts, not only for us to connect the Caribbean, Africa, the US and Europe, but also indispensable routes for a new rewriting of knowledge that defies the limits of the historically existing and the dominant conceptions of the humanities as well? If so, how should we then consider the literary and literature in this context? And this text is very rich in reflections about the literary language and literature too. The question about the status of the humanities seems critical to me today, especially in face of so many expressions of support for Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, and presumably for the critique of systemic racism and anti-Blackness in universities this year. For the humanities not only continue privileging field, traditional fields of inquiry under the specific criteria of excellence, notwithstanding the advances of ethnic studies scholarship through some of those programs within the existing humanities. But also humanities, humanism and the humanities are ground zero for the production of all lives matter discourse. Before those words or those perspectives were found in the mouths of supporters of the current president of this country, they were at the heart of this liberal uh, intellectual formation that is the humanities. That is before all lives matter became a reactionary and often racist response to black lives matter, the humanities had already made all lives matter the centerpiece of their approach. Which is what accounts with the, for the constant minoritization and juniorization of ethnic studies fields. Uh, again, in spite of the many uh, 
great contributions of ethnic studies scholars within that have to do the work within the humanities. For example, as I was pointing out in a recent presentation at the University of Miami's Humanities Institute, when you look at the humanities in Puerto Rico, for instance, it is not difficult to observe a tendency to Hispanophilia and Mestizophilia that is part and parcel of anti-Blackness and that helps to explain the indifference to Afro-Puerto Rican populations in the island. This book, of course, is a major correction of that path. And when you look at the stateside US, humanity spaces often appear to be homes for white benevolence and white condescendence. I bet that pretty much every scholar of color listening to this presentation right now can tell stories and stories and stories about encounters with white benevolence and condescendence when interacting with colleagues and leaders in the humanities. That is the humanities as a project has focused on relativizing claims for racial justice more than preparing subjects to be able to faithfully witness and ethically respond to the predicament of black, indigenous, and people of color lives in the modern colonial world. I suspect that it is time in the 21st century to take seriously Winter's argument about a new studio, and maybe something even larger than a new studio, and dare to think of a ceremony to be found after humanism and after the humanities. I would encourage the readers of Decolonizing Diasporas to look for the terms and grammar of this new practice of knowledge production. And I suggest that they pay close attention to the main terms in each of the chapters, relations, intimacies, witnessing, destierro, reparation, apocalypse, and the coda entitled C, or heretic terminologies within the term of the current order of knowledge that focuses on disciplines and areas. These are keywords to faithfully witness Black and Indigenous lives across the Afro-Atlantic, as well as key pieces in what might be the architecture of a form of produ production of knowledge after the humanities. I submit to your consideration that Decolonizing Diasporas is a text in what could be called not humanities proper, but rather counter-humanities, an area that evokes Winter's own concept of the counter-novel and that I see as part of what I have called elsewhere, counter-catastrophic thinking and artistic activity. While the humanities are a quintessential piece of what Winter calls man one, which enter into crisis with the unfolding of man two, the counter-humanities are part of the terrain of heretic and prophetic discourses that counter and exceed the horizon of humanistic inquiry towards post-apocalypsos, perhaps following Professor Figueroa's reflection in the last chapter of Decolonizing Diasporas. Let me conclude with another act of relation, relation again, following our dear professor, this time also including an ancestor. I refer to the Biafran and Nigerian philosopher, playwriter, poet, stage director, and literary theorist, Esiaba Irobi, who left us too early when he was too young, 10 years ago at the age of 50. Irobi is the author of an essay entitled Philosophy of the Sea in a web dossier entitled Worlds and Knowledges Otherwise, which he concludes with a myriad of questions. I invoke Irobi's presence because the concluding chapter of Decolonizing Diasporas is entitled C, S-E-A, and I believe that it represents a counter philosophy of the sea, very much in the spirit, very, very much in the spirit of Irobi's reflections. Irobi was a proud African who was enamored with the Caribbean. Perhaps not unlike Professor Figueroa is in love with Africa too. More than 10 years ago, Irobi wondered whether young scholars in Caribbean and Africana studies were going to be able to quote, redefine the word intellectual to include non-academic literary and topographic discourses such as um, carnival, music, dance, rituals, religious performances, among other human expressions. He also asked other questions that I would like to read and partly uh, offer them to Professor Figueroa for reflection. And hopefully we can hear more about how she addresses these in, in her own words in the book. This is from Professor Irobi's essay, Philosophy of the Sea, referring to younger intellectuals, right? This is 10 years, uh, more than 10 years ago, looking ahead, thinking, what would they do? Are they going to transcend the written word and theorize from an indigenous Caribbean perspective? 
the occult powers of the spoken word, the chanted word, the body in dance, in motion, in rapture, whirling, genuflecting, recalling, channeling, revealing, prophesying, will they be able to make the West understand that there are forms of things unknown, discourses beyond the lore of the West? Will we be able to take European philosophers to that place in human experience where reason must lay down its arms, that transcendent, that transcendent area, the growth of ancestral spirits, full of cultic knowledges and aboriginal force, which are glimpses not through cognitive understanding as taught by the West, but through revelation, as evidence in the spiritual literacy and complex performative texts of the African-American church, the Candomblé, Santeria, Abaqua, Nith, uh, night ceremonies in Jamaica, Dambala in Haiti, Ogun festival in Yoruba land, Ama Dioa in Igoland, and numerous ceremonies of worship and initiation and funerary rites executed by those whose humanity, day-to-day -day experiences, presence, and philosophical intelligence have been questioned for centuries. How will we represent our ancestors and parents whose education took a different turn and texture, souls whose wisdoms we are expected to represent and defend in the academy, minds out of whose crystallized narratives of the pain of being and nothingness we make our living? I still find incredibly moving and intriguing, close quote, I still find incredibly moving and intriguing that while Irobi was a proud African, he thought that he was, quote, pertinent to ask these questions in the Caribbean. To the Caribbean, as a representative African diasporic people, because the Caribbean, more than Africa or Europe, and this is Irobi, has been the vortex and testing ground of both the integrity and efficacy of both African and European perceptions, definitions and applications of philosophy in the real world, away from the certainties of the, academy, the academies and citadels of the Sorbonne or the great civilizations of Kush, Zimbabwe, and Ile Ife. In this new world, this supposedly no man's land, something strange and beautiful was forged here, referring to the Caribbean, close quote. I'm not going to elaborate on Irobi's formulation other than to make three quick points. First, we need to keep building connections across the Caribbean and Africa, as well as the diasporas. Too much has been lost by not taking this connection seriously. In this, the colonizing diasporas is doing some important work of reparations. Second, these uh, both of the imaginary and also of the intellect of the mind, of course. Second, this archive might have crucial contributions to the project of thinking knowledge after man, after humanism and after the humanities towards and beyond the counter humanities. And three, yes, my dear Esiaba, you are totally right. Something strange and beautiful was forged here in the Caribbean, in the sea, and in the Afro-Atlantic world. And even though you are not here with us to witness it, I am glad to say that those younger scholars that you had in mind are indeed responding to your call for the philosophy of the sea. And that Professor Figueroa's work is making sure that yet new young scholars and older ones continue contributing to this body of work an epistemic, ethic, and political project. I'm so happy for the publication of your wonderful and groundbreaking book, Yumaira, and I look forward to remaining in dialogue with it and to keep learning from your upcoming work for so many years to come. Thank you. I pass the word to you, Benita, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also want to begin by congratulating uh, Yomaira. I think her book is really groundbreaking and it is a must uh, for uh, all of our courses that we teach. And uh, I think it will be an important book for the next few years as well. I also want to thank uh, Northwestern University Press for obviously the publication, but also for arranging this uh, round table today. And I want to express my solidarity with Professor uh, Lorgia Garcia Peña. And of course, it is a pleasure to be in the same panel with Nelson Maldonado Torres as well. The Colonizing Diasporas, uh, Radical Mappings of Afro-Atlantic Literatures is a timely and eloquently written book whose prose is both poetic and evocative while critically unrelenting. In a perfectly balanced architecture, the book is structured in an introduction, followed by five chapters and a coda under the banners of conceptually powerful categories, relations, intimacies, witnessing, destierro, reparations, and apocalypso. 
And the coda is also poetically entitled C, a certainly most appropriate closing for a book on Afro-Atlantic connectivities. Through its chapters, the book works with and weaves together novels, poetry, essays, short stories, and visual musical texts. And Yomaira engages with the work of a number of writers from Equatorial Guinea, Juan Tomás Ávila Laurel, Donato Endongo Vidiogo, Melibea Obono, and Joaquín Embomio Bachen. And she reads their works side by side, those of Latinx writers, Nelly Rosario, Junot Díaz, Loida Maritza Pérez, Ernesto Quiñones, Daniel José, and the Afro-Cuban singer, Ivey. The ultimate aim of her book is to engage with diasporic Afro-Puerto Rican, Afro-Dominican, Afro-Cuban, and diasporic Equatorial Guinean cultural productions to, quoting Yomaira, push the boundaries of the colonial thought. In her project, Yomaira effectively puts into practice some of the predicaments that Adolfo Campoy Cubillo and I articulated together in the introductory essay of a recent double special issue of the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies entitled Entering the Global Hispanophone. We addressed this new paradigm as, and I quote, an invitation to branch out beyond the traditional archives of Hispanism, engaging with some of the dispersed geographies, cultural and linguistic traditions, and as a determination to break away from the overarching Iberian Latin American binary, embracing other communities, histories, experiences, and repertoires. Yomaira carefully crafts her argument to use the terminology Afro-Latin Hispanic, Afro-Atlantic Hispanophone diasporas and not Black Atlantic in order to puncture perhaps its diasporic dimension and Afro-descendancy. But perhaps also because as she states, Atlantic modernities are contingent upon forms of racialization. To analyze together narratives from Equatorial Guinea in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Hispanic Caribbean, she stresses the concept of relationality, defining the book as a relational project between part of Hispanophone Africa on the one hand and the Hispanophone Caribbean, at least its insular part, on the other hand. Relation relationality has its limits, she acknowledges. But the task is rather to attend to a series of moments in which an array of African and Caribbean cultural, literary, historical, and ideological practices converge. And rather than tracing a carefully neat trajectory where Afro-Puerto Rican, Cuban, Dominican, and Equatoguinean writers and thinkers meet, the colonial diasporas chooses to focus on some of their shared preoccupations and diasporic subjectivities and experiences as reproduced through the selected author's works. Relations is perhaps the most complex task at hand when tracing the connectivity between the insular Hispanophone Caribbean and Equatorial Guinea. But Yomaira searches not only through the legacies of Spanish colonial rule, but also through the shared histories of dictatorships and subjugation to oppressive political and economic regimes and migration and diasporic experience as she builds her narrative. She also makes use of island theory and archipelagic theory to build an extra element of connectivity Thinking in and across island terms is crucial, she writes. And in connection with Latinx studies, she recalls how often diasporic communities in the US have been articulated as archipelagic extensions of the Caribbean geographical imagination. Islandness is another pivotal relational element between the Afro-Hispanic Caribbean and Equatorial Guinea, which is a territory encompassing five islands as well as a mainland dimension. 
studying these nations and nation states from archipelagic and diasporic perspectives shifts dominant and continental discourses towards the, potentially, the potentiality within the Afro-Atlantic Hispanophone archipelago. Yomaira also assumes the parameters of the definition previously articulated that any articulation of Atlantic studies must depart from the premise that Africa is central to the configuration of Atlantic circuits. Hence, the colonizing diasporas aims, in her words, to expand the ways we map these crossings between Spanish-speaking Africa and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean through a sustained mediation on their diasporic and exilic poetics in the pursuit of a radical remapping of Afro-Atlantic Hispanophone subjects. Yomaira traces an Afro-Hispanic Atlantic contour Anchor in colonial legacies, and she privileges two temporary markers in particular, 1898 and the 1960s. In this regard, she claims Equato Guinean diasporic literature is a product of violent processes reminiscent of the Latinx Caribbean diaspora. We are tied to one another Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Equatorial Guinea history and language and struggle connect us. Blackness and hope and survival connect us. I would like to close now with a few questions. I have eight questions in fact, and, and I will leave them in the air, not with the expectation that Yomaira will, will address each and every one of them, but only as a way of opening up the conversation. So question one, how do you see your book in relation to an emerging body of scholarship on both Afro-Latin American studies and also Afro-Spanish thinking, theorization, production, and activism. By Afro-Spanish, I mean Afro-production in Spain of um, scholars and activists and writers such as uh, Lucien Bomillo, Esther Mayoko, Remé Sipi, Silvia Bertlopale, and, and others. Question number two. In what sense do you think it may be viable to pursue a similar project to the one you advance here, tracing the radical mappings of Afro-Atlantic literatures through Afro-Caribbean insularities, but focusing instead on Afro-Atlantic communities of the continental Caribbean, say anywhere from Belize to Colombia? Question number three. What are the teleologies that your project has had to resist while looking for connections on both sides of the Atlantic between Equatoguinean and Latin X emancipation movements? And question four, in selecting African Hispanisms for your project, why focus only on writers and experiences from Equatorial Guinea and not from Western Sahara and Morocco. There were very explicit and direct connections between Abdel Krim and Latin American political leaders, for example. And of course, Western Saharan writers and intellectuals have a long-standing relationship that dates back to 1975, since Cuba was one of the only countries to recognize Western Sahara's independence on 1975 and many Saharawis received long-term grants to study in Cuba. And all the Saharawi Hispanophone writers today, particularly from a certain generation, lived for long periods of time in Cuba. I'm thinking of Lima, Lima Boicha or uh, Bahia Agua. I understand that your project intends to trace an Afro-diasporic heritage across the Atlantic, although, a case for racialization of the Saharawi subject in Cuba um, or abroad in the diaspora, for instance, could be easily built as well as, for example, Paul Ryer has done in his recent book, Beyond Cuban Waters, Africa, La Yuma, and the Island's Global Imagination. Question five. 
Um, do you want to talk uh, about the nuances between the terms exile and diaspora when discussing, for instance, writers such as Melibea or Bono, Avila Laurel, or others that you use in your essay, since going back and forth from the home country to the country of residence is not the typical exilic condition? Question six. Your preference uh, of Afro-Hispanic Atlantic over Black Atlantic denotes a vindication of origins over a bi-directional articulation of identity across the ocean. Do you want to expand on this notion? I know you already state in the book that, of course, you want to, uh, to establish a departure from an Anglo tradition as well, but perhaps you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Seven. Uh, the book, at least from a cursory look at its table of contents, might seem to some to follow a thematic organization, as in witnessing, destierro, reparations, etc. According to your description, each chapter builds on a particular theme that emerges as a shared preoccupation with the analyzed works. How would you respond to potential critics that might claim it has been written from within the teleology of US academia, that it knows in advance where it wants to go and it fills in the gaps to do so? Of course, this is not something we can easily escape, US academia, I mean. Um, it is a political and it is an ethno-racial positioning from which we all, um, all of us here as well at this table speak today and produce our thought. And also it is the framework provided for this round table, uh, the press and the course by virtue of the press and the co-sponsoring organizations, the MLA and LASA. Question eight and the last one. Uh, you claim perhaps rightly so that, and I cite, um, outside of Hispanic studies, however, there is rarely sustained engagement with Equatoguinean literature. This project then is an attempt to engage and relate across these fields from the position of ethnic studies." End of quotation. Yet it is worth noting that departments of Hispanic studies in Accra, in Abidjan, in Yaounde, in Libreville, um, just to mention a few places, have been assiduously engaging with the literature of Equatorial Guinea, working on issues and preoccupations such as Afrofuturism, Afrorealism, Afro resilience, Afrofeminism, ancestral memory, and diasporic resistances and re existences, among other themes. They have also been organizing major international conferences on Hispanic studies. I'm thinking most recently on Accra or Yaounde. So the problem is not so much whether or not they engage with the um, Hispanophone literature of Equatorial Guinea, but what is and is not within our own circuits of knowledge production and dissemination. And so what do we need to do then in order to engage with scholarship and production from outside our own circuits. Thank you. Ivan, so I have some time to respond, right, Ivan? Yeah, I think while we give the audience a chance to send in their questions, uh, let's okay. discuss Nelson and Benito's questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so first, I wanted to um, thank both of the panelists for their super thoughtful um, and um, incredibly generous responses to the book. Um, uh, you know, as, as the author of the book, I uh, know it so well, and I know uh, that if I could have kept on working on it for another like three years, I would have just kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. Um, it's um, I don't have the satisfaction of being the kind of writer that says like, this is, this is the book that it, it, you know, that I wanted it to be. I just always um, feel even now I could have done even more. Um, but thank you for, for your generosity and talking, um, talking, you know, with everyone here um, and sharing with me your thoughts on the book. Um, I want to say that this is very special for me for, um, for two reasons to have you both here. Um, Nelson, um, Professor Malazares, 
um, has been my advisor since I stepped foot in graduate school. He, um, you know, recruited me to Berkeley and convinced me that there was a very vibrant Puerto Rican community in the Bay Area that I could be a part of. Um, and when I got there, there was like five of us. <laughs> I, of course, forgive him for that. Um, it was the best decision that I could have ever made. Um, I am so thankful for my training in ethnic studies, for the kinds of worlds and worldviews that it opened up for me. I joke with my students that when I went to Berkeley, I really, truly in my heart believed that Puerto Ricans were the most oppressed people on the planet um, and that there is no one else that could know our struggle. And I very quickly began to understand and really put into context, into relation, um, the kinds of overlapping forms of dispossession and colonialism um, that create um, and engender so many experiences um, of oppression across the world, um, and specifically across, you know, in the context of my cohort and things that I was learning across North America. And it began to really remap for me even what I could, what I did know and what I could know, right? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Professor Madonna Torres is right that the first time that I heard him talk about um, ethnic studies as heresy, I was really, you know, <laughs> drawn it back, you know, I was like, how could you say that, you know, um, and I hadn't, um, I hadn't really gotten there, and, and then I took a seminar, and we read some of and I was like, oh, this all makes sense now, um, and, and I'm so thankful um, to be able to have those experiences, to have, um, to have that really, like, life-changing experience um, and knowledge um, to, uh, to be able to even create the idea for a book like this. Um, I met Benita, um, some years later, when I was back on the East Coast, um, and I had been giving up, I had given a presentation at the American Studies Conference, and someone came up to me and said, you know, if you're doing work on Equatorial Guinea, you need to speak to this person. You know, like, you, you cannot be doing this work without talking to Benita San Pedro. And so I was, it was really excited, and I was so nervous um, to, to message Benita, and she welcomed me with um, such warmth. Um, and, you know, I kind of like just, you know, just told her everything I wanted to do. And, you know, the first thing that Benita did for me as so she, she didn't know me, had not been, you know, on my committee, nothing, you know, didn't know me from anyone. Um, and one of the first things that Benita did was share with me resources, ideas, and told me that I needed to get my butt to Equatorial Guinea as soon as possible. Um, and that, you know, I wouldn't, my project wouldn't be worth anything if I didn't get and get there and talk to people and go to go to Spain and talk to people and really pushed me to, um, to make that move, to not just read the books, but to really engage. And because of that, I have these really rich relationships um, with uh, Equatorial Guinean writers in, in Spain and in, in Equatorial Guinea. And, and I thank you so much um, for that and for being so kind. And, um, and I think I wrote this in the introduction for pointing me in the, in the directions when I was wrong and, and just telling me, you know, like that's, you, you should rethink that, that position that you have. And so I'm really grateful for that, um, for the both of you. Um, I have um, some ways to think or, or some many ways to approach the kind of questions that have been laid out before. Um, I'm really thankful for really um, for um, the final framing of the sea and thinking about the philosophy of the sea. I really feel like the end of the book as I was writing it, it, it was a moment of like, um, uh, like I don't want to say transcendence, but it was kind of like, I can hardly remember writing the very end of the book. I was in my office and it kind of went into a trance, really thinking through, listening to, um, you know, um, ritual music and, and thinking through these images and this poetry. And it really was this uh, moment where I, where I uh, truly felt that the art, um, the writing, these kind of critical approaches to thinking, um, through these lived experiences, um, through all these artistic forms, were able to open up for me a different way of seeing relationality. Um, and then also bringing me back to some of the earlier texts, including, you know, um, Edward Glissant um, and Jackie Alexander, some of these other folks who are thinking through um, relations in the sea, um, and then moving towards the kind of um, new, um, uh, you know, more recent writers who are thinking through these through these themes. Um, I definitely um, am very thankful for the framing of thinking about like, you know, the ceremony must be found, um, not just after humanism, but after the humanities. And I, I um, would position, and I think, you know, um, Nelson, you and I, I think agree on this. We wrote that piece for the ethnic studies um, roundtable 
um, where there was a, a, a very severe critique of the liberal humanities projects. Um, and I think that there is a necessary turn. I think it's not enough to transform the humanities. I don't think that that is the, the kind of the place where we wanna put our labor and our efforts um, um, in, our, in our search for liberation, but rather um, fundamentally transforming uh, or turning away um, from the humanities as such um, and creating new ways to, um, to see ourselves and to see the world. Um, and I think one of the key parts of the project of ethnic studies was a kind of um, breaking away from the disciplines um, and from the kind of large, large main disciplines that are created in the enlightenment, um, you know, uh, and then from these kinds of fields that get solidified within those, um, within those uh, 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 departments and within those, those fields um, to think about um, ways that we can work across, right? So for me, it was really important um, in this book um, that as I was, you know, I always was a literature person, you know, a literature, you know, novels, books, etc., poetics, poetry. Um, and in fact, you know, I, I would say, I would share this, that at the Caribbean Philosophical Association, um, Nelson would uh, invited me a few years to give the opening poem. And for me, that was really um, an important moment because as a graduate student, you feel like you put away your creative side to focus on this other thing. And so there was always this connection between the scholarly and the poetic, right? This this way that these were not um, uh, delinked from one another, but actually really part of the larger project. And I think um, if we're thinking about ethnic studies um, is, is a step after the humanities, <laughs> um, as I believe it is, um, it is a place in which we take um, from a series of different approaches to knowledge um, to illuminate a question, right? Um, to think about struggle, um, to think about problems, um, and to better be able um, to think through them and beyond them. Um, and so for me, uh, that is an important part of the kind of larger arc of the book, which is, you know, this is about literature. And I think one of the kind of questions that I've gotten so far is like, you know, you say a lot, you keep repeating yourself, like you say, if you take this seriously, if it's taken seriously, you don't have to say that, right? I think even my, one of my reviewers said that to me. Um, and I kept, I kind of kept it. I was like, no, I, I kind of want to keep saying if you take it seriously, because there's a way in which um, literature, arts, aesthetics becomes kind of um, that kind of fly that Cesare talks about. You know, you just swat it away. It's just this little thing. It's just, right, it gets um, reduced from this true um, kind of reflection of the human experience, you know, um, a way of resisting um, and engaging with one's body um, against the world um, to just kind of like, you know, just some people doing who knows artsy fartsy stuff, right? Um, and so for me, it's really important to kind of sit and listen um, to the text and what they're saying and to um, do further research beyond them. So do the kinds of kind of philosophical engagement, the historical context, thinking through sociology, right? Thinking through all of the different fields, right? Um, all the different disciplines um, in order to tell a story rather than just been sitting in one and telling just one side. Of course, it's not perfect, right? Um, but I did want to bear witness to what the writers were saying, um, especially, um, I think one of the, uh, you know, speaking to the writers, for example, from Equatorial Guinea, uh, speaking to the writers who are writing about dictatorship in the Dominican Republic, um, thinking about the ways that their literature, their artwork, um, their expressions, just, you know, even the, the interviews, the, the ways that they talk are, you know, basically giving us gifts of history, right, that, that cannot be officially written down, right, um, or that, that are not officially said anywhere. Um, and so for me, that became a really important part of it. Um, I think I'll speak to a few of the really, um, I don't want to go kind of babble on and on, but there were some really wonderful questions. Um, I'm excited, um, Benita, for the for the for the work that is coming out in the field and you know this book is just one of many books right um that is doing really exciting work i know jeffrey coleman's book um that just came out this summer also through northwestern university press i um, was doing work in um in dramaturgy and looking at theater in spain and um looking at you know the kind of experience of afro like Dominican or Afro Latinx folks or Latinx folks and um, Africans in Spain and, and to one another. So I'm really excited to see the ways that people pursue this. Um, the other day on Twitter, someone said like, oh, this is interesting. I wonder if, you know, you could do this with someone doing things, relationship between like 
Brazil and Sao Tome or in Príncipe, right? Like, and so I'm like, yes, absolutely. Like this, this should be the move, right? Um, I am particularly um, interested in this kind of relationship, um, not only as like a methodological move, right? I'm not necessarily only interested in like the method of like making the connection, right? But really thinking about what the texts tell us. And if we are not intent on using a framework um, and to, to place that framework over the book and say like, well, this book tells us about post-colonial this and decolonialism that, and you know, like, and we can read it through Lacan or through whoever, right? Like there's ways that we can put our lens onto the text. Um, and one of the things that I tried to do was resist it as best I could. And part of the, um, the question that you had about the form of the book, was one of those things that I was resisting very much, right? It, it really forced me to rethink the book to, um, you know, there was a kind of way that I wanted the book to go in my head. Um, and uh, what I realized was some of the texts that I felt that went together weren't really speaking to each other. I had to reformulate those things. Um, and then there was a story or a way that I could help build that argument. Um, but in reality, it was, uh, the text themselves that that lent themselves to that arc. Um, and I am really thankful for that moment of, of giving of me giving in of being like, this is not the way that I wanted it. And in fact, the chapter on intimacies was the very last thing I wrote, and it wasn't going to go in the book at all. And it ended up going because I just, you know, I felt like, well, this is really important. And it doesn't really, you know, there's a way that it explodes everything about the book. And maybe that's the good thing that it can go at the, at the beginning, right? And and there was these important texts that are continually being produced, right? Like, so that's the other thing is that, you know, a lot of these folks are living writers, right? They're writing right now. Um, and so they're, and especially in, in uh, the, for me, I feel like the sense of urgency coming out of the work of Guinea Equatorial um, is incredible. And, and I see that, and I made some moves to talk about that in terms of like um, the economy of the writing. Um, the, the, you know, I, I wasn't interested in having a conversation about like necessarily form or, you know, or even like privileging, this is good writing, this is bad writing, but really trying to get to like, what are they trying to tell us, right? Um, and so in that way, I was able to get, you know, Melibea's La Bastarda in, I'm like, okay, well, she got it. Okay, well, maybe I can, you know, this is constant. And so it's, it was exciting um, to be able to do that. Um, and, you know, to be honest, one of the um, inspirations for doing that is, um, uh, uh, Alex Alexander Wilhelier's Habeas Viscus. Uh, when I read that book, when it first came out some years ago, um, I remember being really intrigued by the questions at the end of each chapter, right? It was like a question and then it would prompt you to the next chapter. And I thought about that book and as I was putting this book together, I was like, oh, this kind of flows. Like, how can I make this clear to my reader that yes, you could read this by itself, but also you could read it together and see how you can, you can build the argument together, right? Um, and um, I hope, you know, people like it. They might not, and that's okay. <laughs> um, I think that um, in terms of, you know, how and why I decided to go with the group of writers I did, um, it would, it, you know, it's really exciting because when I, when I started to go to the MLA, when the Global Hispanic Film Forum was put together, it solidified a space to talk about um, these things. Um, and so it was really exciting for me to listen to folks talk about Western Sahara and Morocco, and then also listen to like the Ecuadorian writers critiques of like Morocco, like, you know, it's so good, you know, it's a lot of juicy like bochinche, you know. Um, but I, uh, I decided to stay in my lane, you know, there's really, there's uh, people doing this work in Western Sahara, there's people doing work in Morocco, um, and uh, as well as doing work in the Canary Islands. And um, for me, it was really important to kind of stick to this and to stick to the to kind of the field. I was already working from, you know, to these three nations in the Caribbean and in, in this diaspora. And then Guinea Equatorial is one country, right? But it's like multiple languages, multiple ethnic groups, five islands, a piece of the continent. Like it was already a lot to juggle with, you know? Um, I think someone had also asked me like, how come Haiti is not it? And I'm like, I can't, you know what? This book was already, <laughs> I can't do it, you know? Um, someone else can pick that up and I'm excited to like be able to see what folks can do, um, you know, taking up some of the some of the frameworks or even, you know, some of the ideas um, and to make the kinds of connections that they wanna make. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the important things I guess that I would want to say, especially for people who are listening um, to this talk, is really revealing part of um, my own limits 
and also um, like the kind of um, uh, move away from mastery that I that I tried to make in putting the book together. So for example, there were many times when I would read a novel from Equatorial Guinea or even from the Latinx Caribbean. And I would say like, I wanna say everything there is to say about this novel. I wanna read it through the eco-critical lens, through this lens, I wanna talk about language, I wanna talk this. And I want, I want no one else to be able to say, like I, I read the book and I really read it well and I'm gonna talk about every aspect of it. And then I realized how that is the kind of, um, that is the remaining kind of uh, desire for a mastery, the remaining desire for having the final say that Eurocentric kind of formation of knowledge that tells you that if you didn't say every single thing, then you didn't do it. And, and there's also the kind of fear of critique. You missed this thing. You could have said that thing, right? Um, and so then it was, for me, a real, a real learning experience um, to then write the book and say, no, there's a limit. And there's, there's enough for many people to say, for many people to think, and for many people to know what is being said in this book and you can't possibly you know speak to every single person for fear right of being told that you're like an imposter and you didn't read it close enough um and so for me it was um that moment and i want to share that because i don't think we talk enough about about you know what it is that we are thinking when we're writing um and, and the fears that we have um as quote unquote literary critics right um i think another thing um important to me was i tried i i really was not interested in critiquing um other people in the book <laughs> and i think that was also a really important part of my ethnic studies training um was you know you take what is useful um you lift up other voices um and you leave the critiques to someone else right like this is not kind of um, a zero-sum game um and i think that that was a uh, really um important for me in the book to bring in as many voices as possible um as many secondary secondary sources as possible also of, like I'm not the only one that talked about this novel. These are like five other people talked about this novel. They're really good and read the footnotes, you know, like, and, I, and I'm going to bring that into the conversation. Um, and I think I wanted to uh, say a few more things. Um, I wanted to say, you know, on the question of um, exile and diaspora, in the chapter on Destierro, um, when I originally wrote this for my dissertation, um, and, you know, Nasma Lamas Rosa knows this, um, I had written a chapter on exile and I had used, you know, post-colonial thinkers to frame that chapter, including like Saeed, um, Sehan and some others. Um, and I also, um, in that was, even when I was first writing the book, I was like exile and diaspora. And, and, and I had lots of footnotes and lots of parentheses trying to explain to the reader over and over again that I knew that it wasn't the same, that I didn't want to conflate it. <laughs> um, and I had to let that go at a certain point because I felt like I couldn't get through a, a chapter without having to, having to repeat that, like, I do know that these are different. This is the historical context, et cetera. But I also wanted to, in that chapter, offer something to decolonial thought that had offered me so much, right? Like, I knew that the reason why I went to post-colonial theory for my chapter on exile was because post-colonial theory is so very rich um, and full of, um, of both creative, theoretical, um, and, and personal works, right? Um, that ex examine and think through the kind of phenomena of exile and that that had not yet been a central part of decolonial thought. And rather than thinking about it as an absence, right? And I think this is something that I get from, from Nelson, rather than thinking about it as an absence, thinking about it as, um, uh, you know, we haven't gotten there yet, right? Like they're, they're, we're like there's certain ways that we're, we're getting to, we're building, right? And so I wanted to, this to be just part one way within the frame of decolonial thought. Like, how can we think about that? Well, here, well, here's one way that we could do it, right? Um, and then building through these authors and thinkers. Um, and in that way, knowing that the writers from Guinea, like such as, you know, Juan Tomas, who goes back and forth, um, but never extremely safely, right? Like, it, it, you know, so that, that exile is, um, is extremely fraught. Um, there is a resistance in his return um, that I think is um, important to note. Um, the way that Melibea moves, the way that even someone like Reme Sipi goes, right? Like she's not an exiled writer necessarily. She will go back to her town, um, um, to Rebola. And, and, but it's, um, it is also a frustrated, right, um, return. Um, and I think that that for me was really important to, to get through. And in many ways, exile and diaspora don't really get to it. The book is decolonized and diaspora because I feel like, you know, we are talking about these populations that are away from their homelands, right? Um, and I feel like their work is decolonizing work. Um, 
but this is why I think that chapter this detail gets to it. It's about uh, being torn away from your home in multiple ways, right? Um, that can encompass exile, that can encompass diaspora, um, and, and that can be intergenerational, right? And, and also metaphysical in some ways. Um, I think I can um, leave it there. I, can, I, I, I wanna go back to a lot of the questions. Um, they were really great. And there, there's a lot of things that I wanna say, um, but I would, I would love to hear questions if there are questions in the Q&A. Um, and also I'd be happy if uh, the panelists would jump into at any point, yeah. <laughs> I love the architecture of the book, and I did uh, pick on this, um, um, you know, like ethical principle that you invoked, right, in your writing of the book, where you do not criticize other scholars. You only use other scholars if, if you know, if they are relevant to your book, uh, to your argument. Um, you quote them, but always extremely respectful. And I think. Um, that is an, an ethical principle within academia as well that deserves um, you know, a comment of its own as well, right? And um, I don't know if in connection with this, you want to address uh, one of the questions I am seeing on the chat, because I am also very interested in, in hearing your take on it, right? Um, what is your take on decolonizing the curriculum especially currently, I guess, in the current contemporary times, right? Yes. Um, okay, so there's something, um, I just had a conversation the other day um, with a colleague of mine, and I hope if she's here, then she will be hear me hash this out. Um, but on the one hand, I am, I think like many folks who are invested in decolonizing um, politics and practices are tired of the use of decolonization um, as just this kind of move to make um, uh, a curriculum less white, right? Rather than fundamentally changing, you know, what we're teaching and how we're teaching. Um, I think, you know, one of my colleagues who's a Victorianist said the other day that, you know, the, the range of um, decolonizing curriculum can go from adding one person of color to a syllabus like would be done in the UK with a curriculum that's already created and everyone has the same standard and to even add one person would be like completely, you know, turn everything upside down um, to completely shifting um, the work. For me, I think part of decolonizing the curriculum, if we're gonna, if we're going to um, take that up in good faith, if it's a good faith actual effort, um, for me, one of the most important um, courses that I ever took that reframed the way that I teach my classes was uh, Nelson Mandela Torres's Theorizing the Human, um, which is beginning from, it, and I feel like I can, I'm able to bring these questions into any class that I teach, um, which is a, a fundamental rethinking um, of what the university is, what the human is, how we're, how we're coming to this classroom, um, uh, how we're coming to, to question what is knowledge, um, and so it's not necessarily only about, and of course, this is beautiful if you quote unquote diversify um, your syllabi, right? By bringing in uh, people of color, women, trans, gender non-binary um, and queer folks into your, into your syllabus. Um, but for me, it's also about making sure that we are asking the question. There's a way that we can, you know, diversify our syllabus and still have, you know, a white supremacist you know, liberal humanist classroom that doesn't actually challenge, right? Um, the kind of preconceptions that we have about whose work matters and what kinds of people in human lives matter um, and what visions of the of liberatory futures look like. Um, so I think it's more than just changing the syllabi. It's about a fundal and radical um, shift in, in the attitude that we have, right? And I think, again, that's, that's another concept of Nelson Mandela Torres is, is the, the decolonial attitude, which for me um, is something that I remind myself of often, right? Um, to think about how we can um, uh, shift the kinds of reasoning that is imposed on us um, to think um, more generously, more lovingly, um, and more critically about the ways that we engage the world and knowledge. So for me, decolonizing the curriculum, again, is not just adding uh, and shifting out, switching out books in the syllabus, but actually fundamental rethinking um, of, of 
what we are doing. And um, one of the things that we have here at MSU uh, in the graduate program is one of the earliest classes that the students take um, is a class called Race, Gender, and the Human, right? Before we even get to um, questions of, um, you know, how do you decolonize, you know, medieval studies or, you know, what, like, where did we even get these frameworks from? How do we get to this place? Um, and how do we reimagine where we can go once we know what has happened, right? Um, so that is, I think that's the, the short of it for me, but I would love to hear other people's thoughts on it also. Um, I don't know if there's other questions. Ivan, I don't know if you want to point out questions for me to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's questions pouring in. Uh, here we go. Uh, I have one right here, which I found interesting. This is from Maria Firmino Castillo. Uh, she first says, uh, Dr. Figueroa, thank you for this work. Your approach is necessary and refreshing. Uh, can you say a bit more about the fear of critique and the attachment to mastery as the ultimate colonial trope? He also wants to know if you've written about this idea somewhere uh, so she can share it with her students or their students. Okay. Yes. Um, so I think part of the, when I'm talking about when I talked about the fear of critique and, and the, the attachment to mastery, um, is that I think especially like, you know, one of the things I'm really open about is, and, and I don't think this is just for me, uh, honestly, I think maybe other people feel this way, but one of the things that I've always been honest about is the fact that I'm a first generation high school and college graduate. My family is a working class family. And so going to the, you know, going to university um, and especially in my literature classes, especially in the humanities, um, you know, I felt very kind of um, left out, dismissed, right? Like I would raise my hand and say something and you see the other people be like, you know, um, as, you know, happens in undergrad classes. Um, and so you, as you continue through that, you know, there is a sense of, um, you know, people talk about like imposter syndrome, right? Like this idea that you have to like, you don't know as much, as much as you do, it's not enough. Someone's going to find you out. Someone's gonna find out one day you don't belong there, right? They're gonna take your fellowship away um, and then you go and go back home, you know? Um, and so for me, um, this question of criticism was um, this quote unquote fear of criticism was also like me trying to make sure that I did my work and did it well, right? Like, so this idea that, you know, if I'm gonna read, let's say I was reading, um, you know, a Song of the Water Saints or one of these novels, you know, I had to read, you know, it's the kind of move towards reading secondary students and see what other people have said. Um, there's that one thing, but then, um, and then writing about those and making sure that you include those, right, as this kind of, you know, the kind of hermeneutic practice, but also this kind of like ethical practice of citations. But then there's the other part where if you're reading a book that not many people have read before, and you want to talk about that book, there is the kind of, for me, was the sense like, you know, I want to say everything that there is to be said about that. And when I caught myself writing and writing and writing and having every kind, like, and I would shit and subheading, and now I'm going to read the same thing that I just told you about for 20 pages a different way. I realized that actually that was not, um, that was not like a generous thing for me to do. That was me trying to cover my basis, right? So rather than me trying to kind of pull and sit with the text, um, it was the sense that someone else would read the book and and um, and see something that I didn't, and I didn't want to get caught out there, right? Um, and I think that for me, it was really important to to when I saw it and identify it, step back for it and realize that it was um, the kind of um, more dominant narratives that we have about the academy. Um, that the, these kinds of places impose on us, um, that if you don't do it all this way, or you know, you you left out this important thing, then our work is already washed, like uh, kind of dismissed. And I think we're under the. Um, I think part of this is also um, the fact that as scholars of color, as first generation scholars, our work is very easily dismissed. As, as scholars who are doing work in ethnic studies. You know, one of the funny things one of my professors once said is, you know, if you miss the little period, they'll just like push your application away, right? If you didn't close your quotation mark, that's one, you know, one point against you. Um, and so there is something really, um, I think that gets that gets um, instilled in us is the sense that like, not only do we have to do things and do them well, but we have to do them as perfectly as possible um, for fear, right? 
um, that we will be com like our work will be dismissed. And when our work, um, it, it, and when our work is like, um, for me, I feel like I really want people to buy this book, right? And the reason I want them to buy the book is that I want them to like buy some of the novels that I talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to support the artist, you know? So, you know, when your work is, when you feel your work has this particular kind of like ethical imperative, you want to make sure you get to as many people as possible, you know? How beautiful would it be if, you know, some of these writers um, got their work taught more, seen more, circulated more, you know? Um, and, and for me, that's, that's kind of some of the important parts important parts of it. So um, I think I digressed on that question a little bit, but I do think that white supremacy is the ultimate enemy and it will have you second guessing yourself. Um, and it will have you like doing the most when you need to do just the regular amount, um, especially when that regular amount has enough heart in it, you know? Um, so I think I'll leave that there. <laughs> that was great. I, I am loathe uh, to end in any other point than that. Uh, we're, we're a little bit over time. Do you think we we want to do one more question? I would I would uh, defer to the panelists. I don't want to bring any extra labor to anybody. Do we have time for one more or should we say goodbye? Jomaira, how are you feeling? This is your party. I'm feeling okay. I think we could take one more question. And I also would, if the panelists have any response, uh, that's also good. We could probably take one more question and then the response. Okay. I'm actually going to steal one from the Facebook uh, page. Here we go. Uh, uh, how do you think your scholarship can create new alliances between different Black ethnic groups in the United States, Spain, and other parts of the world? I'll put it in the Q&A box in case you need to refer to it. Yeah, because I couldn't hear it. Well, where'd you put it in the Q and A? I'm gonna send it to you directly right now. Okay, thank you. So our uh, panelists will see it. I'll read it again though. How do you think your scholarship can create new alliances between different Black ethnic groups in the United States, Spain, and other parts of the world? Okay, awesome. And I think that connects to some of the other questions in the um, in the Q and A. I see one Ariana Brown talking about the intimacies between Black folks in the diaspora and Afro-Indigenous folks and someone else talking about Native American Caribbean studies, indigenization, et cetera. Um, yeah. So I will say that there's there's a real deep connection between these questions. Um, I think one of the, you know, while the book is looking at, um, you know, Afro-Latinx folks in the US and then um, equito Ghanaian folks in Spain, um, when I am talking about the US context, there is some attention to looking at the, the histories. And I think at the very beginning talking about um, you know, uh, African American, you know, and Afro Latinx work, and really trying to, uh, you know, kind of flesh out um, what Afro Latinx um, experiences, what do they offer within this context? How can we understand them? Um, but also when it comes to questions um, around, for example, reparations, you know, I, I think that chapter for me was really important and it began to take a different kind of formation after. I became a faculty member and was going to conferences and listening to and, and I talk about in that chapter going to a conference and and engaging the kinds of you know being like a, a witness to the conversations between um, you know African American folks and um, indigenous folks and the discussions around reparations right the kind of like you know you can have the meal but the 40 acres are ours or you're you know uh, I think I quoted a uh, one John Baker. Um, uh, Barker uh, article where uh, they're talking about the Occupy Wall Street movement and um, the kind of the accusations uh, between of the black community or one member of the black community to, towards indigenous people saying like you just want to displace us and bring indigenous people here right and I thought about what is the role literally like standing on the sidelines of this I was like what is the role of like a black colonial subject like a diaspora black colonial subject in this conversation like do I slowly back out of this room right this very uncomfortable moment or do I like sit in and think about, um, you know, what is my, um, what are my commitments to these, not only to these conversations, and, but to these struggles? Um, and what do I owe um, to these moves for liberation and reparations? And part of it was owing a listening to what that looks like, especially from the position of a kind of displaced 
subject that is also colonial subject that is also a black person right like um but that would not have for example the reparation claims to the u.s in the ways that african americans would but thinking about it from the from the perspective of puerto rico and then think about it from here right so like for me it's that like that complexity um that that is the kind of embodiment of what Jackie Alexander and what women of color feminists, including Audre Lorde, call the relations across difference, right? And so I pull from pedagogies of crossing a lot in the text to think about the ways that um, these women of color feminists, and they're talking about the political term women of color feminists that has a historical and political meaning, right? Um, not just like women of color light in the way that it's been white whitewashed in the moment. Um, but thinking about the way they are demanding that we do the labor of learning each other's history um, and uh, attempting to uh, not only make alliances, but step in the fray for one another um, and to be able to um, kind of shift the terms of engagement, but also to step away from the kind of colonial and like um, dominant narrative that seeks to fracture us from one another. Um, and one of the things that they talk about is that that kind of work is really hard. It's really hard to put aside your own histories of hurt and uh, struggle and survival um, and then center someone else's, right? Um, but that this is the kind of important work that would help us to remap and rethink um, the human and human relation and also would help us to kind of imagine a different kinds of liberation struggle. And this is something that we've seen embodied, right? Through like history in the Caribbean, um, you know, uh, you know, thinkers and writers going to um, Africa, I'm thinking like Franz Fanon taking up, right, um, taking up the question of Algeria, um, thinking about folks moving through the world, right, um, in a way um, where their struggle is not the only one at the fore, right, um, uh, and yet and still being able to add to that. And so I think um, for me, the kind of alliance. Um, is one in which, you know, putting relationality as a center of the project becomes important. Um, but I think also um, the scholarship itself, like, you know, one of the things that I'm doing is reading these works and then using foundational works in like, uh, you know, Latinx, Caribbean, African, US, um, African American folks, right? Like all of these, um, these uh, modes of thinking scholarships together to read the set of texts. And for me, that is like, you know, an intellectual alliance um, that also um, on the other side shows um, an actual, you know, reflects this kind of form of solidarity and understanding of one another. Um, I think that there's there's a lot to be said about um, Afro-Latinx and African-American, Black, et cetera, um, uh, relations in the United States. Um, uh, and I, I, that's to talk about at another time, but I think there, there is um, not a time in our, in our historic moment that like Afro-Latinx folks and African-American folks have not been in relation to create um, incredible like movements, cultures um, and, and political organizing and that we can't forget that in this moment. Thank you, Professor Rivera Vasquez. And again, uh, thank you to the panelists, Professor San Pedro and Maldonado Torres. Uh, we will leave you there. Uh, everybody have a good night. Tomorrow we've got to go back to work. So please rest up. Oh, wait, I just wanted to say sorry. Sure. Um, yeah. I don't know if the panelists wanted to respond to anything before we wrap up. Well, so I, I will have two final comments. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that um, I admire, and I, I said it before, but I think it needs to be reiterated, particularly in our current um, academic climate, right? Um, that I admire your ethical stance and respect for other uh, scholars' work by not engaging in polemic and criticism with their work. Uh, but I also admire your generosity in conceiving your book and offering your book as a kind of conduit uh, for, uh, to foster visibility for literary authors uh, with uh, limited channels for dissemination as some of those that you engage uh, with in, in your book. And um, just as a final recommendation that I think this book should be part of the academic curriculum and our syllabi, uh, both for graduate and undergraduate courses. So I recommend it highly. And to follow up uh, with that, I think when you read the book, um, you realize that uh, you can do 
um, doctoral seminar out of the theme of each chapter. You can do a doctoral seminar on intimacies, destierro, you can do one on the sea, uh, uh, the various parts of it. And again, none of it is being defined in a traditional uh, way through kind of language or only area, but by fundamental themes that respond to key questions of the Afro-Atlantic diaspora. And in that way, that those very, uh, that kind of framework and, and groundwork that the book offers serves as a platform for graduate study on the graduate study, but also for social movements that are seeking to affirm and are building from legacies of other Afro-Atlantic and Black and Indigenous uh, people of color movements. And this is the way, I mean, one of the questions was about how build connections and so on. And uh, there are uh, a plethora of connections that exist already on, on the ground. But what this work does is that you elevate, you increase, you bring to visibility yet new areas. So a text like this one, I see fundamental both for university graduate training and so on in the introducing this counter humanistic perspective in a creative way, but also uh, uh, contributing to social justice thinking and to social movements. And in the like, that, like there is that arc that uh, with the questions already pointing to the social movement work. And then that, that arc will come back and also and inform also this reflection and further reflections about intimacies, further reflections about coloniality, the coloniality of reparations. And I'm delighted that reparations is uh, kind of becoming a, a prevalent theme uh, in uh, literature in the, in the Hispanic Caribbean, in Puerto Rican studies too. And I'm thinking about Rocio Zambrana's uh, upcoming book or reparations uh, with Duke University, another press. Uh, uh, will come uh, next year. And uh, uh, she's also addressing reparations and she does it, uh, while this book does it with in relation with faithful witnessing and reparations, she does it from the perspective in dialogue with a uh, philosopher of history and critical theory and is in uh, through reckoning, through the concept of historical reckoning. So you have historical reckoning there, faithful witnessing here. There is already a, a, a dialogue that I hope that we can have about how these books are approaching reparations and, and, and also, but this will have to be linked, you know, with us uh, and, and Yomaira, in fact, in this book, it makes reference to the movements for reparation. These movements are active and alive and they are part of larger movements for decolonization and decoloniality, which is not simply an academic topic. It's about struggles and, 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 and forms of organizing on the ground. And this is part of the work that we need to do to the really decolonize knowledge in the university. And that's why it is, so this text, when you take it seriously, as Yomaira uh, uh, encourages us to do, when you took this literature that she focuses on seriously, and when you take this book seriously, explodes also, not only the humanities, but the university itself. And we can already begin, and ethnic study has been a place where we can have uh, kind of anticipated, we can have, uh, we have practice that work of producing knowledge not really so much within, but beyond the university, even where we are part of it to some extent. And so that's going to continue to be part of the struggle for a while. And a text like this is really fundamental in helping us to move to those different layers and connections between scholarship, artistic work, literary work, music, there is visual art in this book, and then we can connect it uh, uh, increasingly with social movement theorizing and social movement activism. That's where I would uh, leave it with my comment. Thank you so much um, for that. And thank you, Ivan. And this is being recorded, right? Um, so it'll be available, especially for folks who had to leave or folks who joined late um, to be able to see the earlier parts of it. Um, thank you again to Northwestern University Press and to everyone um, for attending and to the panelists um, for their super generous, super, super generous um, comments and questions. I truly, truly appreciate it. The first time author really appreciates it. <laughs> um, and thank you, Evan. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.